are continuing in this message series entitled Sermon on the Mount. This is the longest consecutive recorded message that Jesus gave. If you can imagine Jesus up on a mountain surrounded by first his disciples, but then also by the crowd. Some people love him, some people hate him. And he's there and he begins to share a countercultural message. It went completely against the grain, even for religious people and non-religious people alike. And Jesus is speaking this truth out. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. This is part number 18 today. We're not quite there, but we're getting there. And we're going through step by step, scripture by scripture, to hear what Jesus had to say. And it's as if some 2,000 years later, we, his disciples, are, are standing there or sitting there listening to Jesus share on the mountain. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. This is Jesus speaking. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In fact, in the Bible, there's about 250 times where the phrase, do not be afraid or do not be anxious or some variation of that is listed. And so this is a common theme, Old Testament, New Testament, certainly in the ministry of Jesus, a very common theme that's brought out. But if I'm being honest with you, uh, many times when I have read scriptures like that or heard messages preached by other people, I get a little bit skeptical or at least a little bit resistant to it because it sounds too good to be true. It sounds simple, and a lot of times simple answers to complex situations aren't real. And so maybe you're here today and you're just the way I've been many times in my life where you are absolutely overwhelmed, stressed out, full of anxiety. Maybe it's led to places of depression and fear and just emotional, physical sickness for you to hear someone like me read a scripture that says, do not be anxious about anything, about your life, about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, about what kind of clothes you're going to put on. And you hear something like that as I have oftentimes and I think, That sounds good. Boy, wouldn't that be nice if it was that simple. And yet I think there is a fundamental challenge that God puts before us because he begins right away to push against how we see ourselves and how we see life. First he says, is not life more than food and the body for more than clothing? So the challenge is, is the things that we try to make our lives about, that next vacation, the promotion we've been hoping for, a little bit more influence at church, you know, a relationship that we don't have but we want, whatever it is that we try to make it about, God's saying, is life not more than that? Because if that's all that your life is about, then yeah, it makes sense that when you have those things, life is great. And when you don't, they're terrible. And you kind of ebb and flow and go along with whatever your resources or particular situation would lend to. But Jesus says, is not life more than those things? Jesus continues to press against kind of the way we see ourselves and the way we see life. In the next verse, 26 Look at the birds of the air, begins to compare us to other things that he's created, but lesser things. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And so this is where God's saying, listen, the birds of the air, they're not nearly as strategic as you and I. They don't have calendars or task lists emails, cell phones. They don't have 401ks. They don't have barns to put things in, and, and they don't have all of the, all the plans and processes and procedures that we have, although I'm thankful for those. As someone who runs this church and, and has you know, employees and ministries and budgets, you got to be strategic. You got to think through these things and grow in your disciplines that way, but it's, Jesus is saying, birds don't do any of that, and yet I take care of them. And then in comparison, aren't you more valuable to me than the birds of the air? And so the reality begins to set in that Jesus sees our life first as more than just all the things that we can get and experience and the measure of peace 
and joy and hope that we can have in our lives is dependent upon how we grasp the identity that we have in Jesus Christ as defined by Jesus Christ. Again, you're more valuable than the birds of the air. God, so his answer, his rebuttal, if you will, to the anxiety and the stress of our lives is identity, 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 and vision, vision, vision. Our vision is it's more than the things that we can accumulate and experience, and our identity is we are beloved by God. Our hope is rooted in that identity. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, certainly not the only scripture on this, but it says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, these things are the pressures of life. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We sang a moment ago, we're covered by the blood of, of the lamb. Now, if you have never been to church and you're not a Christian and you're walking and you're like, why am I singing? I'm covered in the blood. I can see where that'd be real, you know, awkward, very difficult to read. The simplicity of it is this, and, the, and yet the power of it is this. The structure in which God set up forgiveness was that there must be a sacrifice, there must be blood. In the Old Testament, that was animals, and it temporarily covered for the sin and the brokenness of mankind. But then Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and he became the ultimate final sacrifice. His blood spilled out for us on the cross of Calvary. His sacrifice not only forgave us of our sins, freed us from our past, the rewriting our history, and has given us a hope and future, not just one day in eternity in that we'll spend with him in heaven, which is a blessing in and of itself, but here and right now where we have open access to the kingdom of God and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so when we sing we're covered by the blood, it is a reminder that all of our past, our current, and our future is covered by the goodness of and the sacrifice of God. So again, if God is with us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That is identity. Sons and daughters of the living God to whom he has given his life for. Matthew chapter six, now the next verse, 27 and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his, to his span of life? Now, I don't know if Jesus was being a little bit facetious in this or if he was just messing with people, but he kind of said a duh statement. And yet it's something that we miss all the time. I do. I have this friend. Um, he pastors a church. I love him dearly, but he's, he's had some really bad health issues some bad surgeries that have had to take care of him to keep him alive, but have called massive uh, issues in his internal organs and, and body. And the medical community has no answers for it. There's no, there is no hope for it. And it's just, it is what it is. It's a miracle that you're alive and you're going to live with this for the rest of your life. That's the word of the doctor's report. And yet I, I asked him, like, how are you holding up under this pressure because I know like his wife is crumbling under it. His church is struggling with it. Uh, me as a friend, I'm broken as I think about my friend who is in so much pain and agony. And he begins to just challenge me, Jerry, what would me worrying about it do for the good of my family and me? It doesn't help me. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't change anything. Worry does not bring about the goodness of God. He just really pushed against it. And really, you could say it this way, that worrying is illogical, it's unproductive, and in many regards, it's harmful. When you become someone that's consumed with worry, it actually hurts you physically and emotionally. It causes more damage. And so this, Jesus is saying, it makes no sense to worry about the things that you don't have control over. It makes no sense whatsoever. To give this to the Lord and trust that the Lord who feeds the birds, and we're going to read here in a moment, who clothes the lilies, for the one that does that to trust in God. Again, if I'm you right now, some of you, you're thinking the same thing. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm glad we know what logic is, but it doesn't change my life right now. You may have heard it said this way, you can worry yourself to death, 
but you cannot worry yourself to life. And it's true. It doesn't add anything. And let me, let me clarify something because this is important. There's a difference between being stressed out and having anxiety. Stressed out is you're responding to the things that are coming at you. Stressors come and stressors go. If you don't believe me, you know, you just go to work, right? <laughs> go to a family gathering. Stressors come and stressors go. It's good days and there's bad days. There's times I'm stressed. There's times I'm like, we got to get to hit the, hit the deadline. We got to get this done. And I'm thankful by the grace of God that in my weakness, his strength is made real and, and known to me. And I'm able to not just ebb and flow with the stressors of life, but I'm able to overcome and be victorious in those things. Stressors come, stressors go. Anxiety feels a lot like stress, but what anxiety is, is anxiety is there whether there's stressors or not. You are carrying the burden of life. It is eating you up, it is crushing you, it is bearing you under the weight and the pressure. And what Jesus is saying, when you're living that and you're worried about everything, what's happening right now, what might happen in the future, what's happening across seas, what's going to go on with that promotion, when you're worried about absolutely everything, you are not adding to your life. You cannot worry yourself into more, better life. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 through 30, and why are you anxious about clothing? Jesus continues on. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and how they, how they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like, the one, like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you Oh, you of little faith. And so now it's starting to get a little bit personal. It's starting to kind of get down to brass tacks here. Jesus is saying, listen, why are you worried about the clothing? It's not just about clothing. I hope you can see past the specific words that are said. Why are you worried about your life? Why is that anxiety weigh on you? Why are you anxious about these things? Looking at the lilies, they neither toil nor spin. And yet we, we run around like chickens with our heads cut off trying to solve everything, be everything to everybody. And you look at the lilies and they don't do any of that. And yet God clothes them and takes care of them. And their life is here and gone. It's nothing. They're, they grow up, they're cut down, they're thrown into the furnace, here and gone. And yet God, who loves us more than any of, other, of his creation, is saying, if I'm going to take care of them, I'm going to take care of you. And then... Jesus begins to press a little bit harder, a little bit deeper. He says, oh, you of little faith. And that could sting. And that has been used in very inappropriate wrong ways in the church. It's become abusive. But I do want to remind us of this before I begin to unpack that, because I actually believe there's some healing in just that simple phrase, oh, you of little faith. Before I do that, let me just say this. I am not an advocate for sit back, relax, and just let happen is going to happen. You're right. Say lovey. Jesus is going to do what Jesus is going to do. We are actually called to partner with God. Second Thessalonians chapter three verse ten tells us that if we don't work, we're not going to eat. And so, just sitting back in your lazy boy and be like, I have no stress. I have no anxiety. Someone will pay my bills. This is, someone's going to take care of it. Someone will feed me. Some, no, no, no. God's very clear all throughout his word. We're not to be lazy, to be sluggards, to be people that do not put our hands to the plow. Let's partner with God. Why make things more difficult for God? Are we just trying to make him more of a miraculous God? Like, I'm going to do absolutely nothing, and miraculously, you're going to prosper me. No, God wants us to partner with him, but here's what happens. Oftentimes, one of two things take place. Either we do become that lazy person and we just go, God's going to do what God's going to do. Who am I to, to pray about it, to act upon it, to try to work with God? Let God do what he's going to do. And then we end up inevitably pushing against God or being a weight to God on that and not being someone that comes alongside and says, God, whatever you have for me, I, my answer to you is yes and amen, I will do it. But for me, my temptation's on the other side of that. 
at least the history of my life, is I will pick up all of the work, what's supposed to be for me, and oftentimes what only belongs to God, and I'll try to do all of it. And then when I mess it up, last ditch effort, I'd be like, God, can you bless this mess? Like, can you help me out with this? I, I, somehow I ruined it, right? Let's not do God's job. The miraculous, the things that draw honor and glory to God, the things that we, if we didn't have God, we would be lost. Let's allow God, invite God, celebrate God doing what he has promised for us. And then let's be active friends in that process. And so for us, I don't ever want anybody to walk out of this hearing that you just sit by and let happens, whatever is going to happen, let it happen. No, let's be active, disciplined believers that walk with God on this journey. But back to that statement, oh, ye, oh, you of little faith. Oh, oh, almost want King James. Oh, ye of little faith, thou terrible sinners. Here's a, here is a quote from Gregory Brown. I agree with it and disagree with it at the exact same time, but it's worth reading so I can kind of take it apart here for a moment. Worry is a sin because it denies the wisdom of God. It says that he does not know what he's doing. It denies the love of God, and it says he does not care. It denies the power of God. It says that he isn't able to deliver me from whatever is causing me worry. Here's why, I'll start with why I disagree with it. If you either read a quote like that or your theology sounds and looks a lot like that, here's what you'll do. You'll see someone that's genuinely hurting, overwhelmed by life, stressed, full of anxiety, and you'll see them not as a sheep without a shepherd, as someone to love and care for and come alongside and to weep with those who weep. You won't see them that way. You're going to see them as someone who is a sinner. Oh, you don't believe that God's for you? Oh, you don't know of his character? You don't think that he cares? You're going to see them as somebody that uh, is full of sin, which is why they are getting what they deserve, which is called anxiety. That's certainly not biblical, so I would very much disagree with that. But here's why I would agree with it. Because there does come a point where we as believers hopefully are no longer baby Christians, but we're beginning to grow up. We're getting off the milk and we're getting into some meat. We're getting into some discipline and growth and strength, not by us, but by God. And we're doing that. And there does come a point where you sitting under the weights that God never designed for you. Remember, his, he said that the weight and the burden that he's designed, the yoke that he has for you to carry, that it's light and it's able to be carried by you. He would never tell you that if it wasn't true. That would be abusive. And yet what happens is we end up picking up more burdens than God ever designed for us to carry. And then we look to him when we're being crushed under that weight going, you said that I could handle all this. And God's saying, I did not tell you to pick up those extra things. That extra relationship, all the things that you're doing with your finances there, you're you're trying to get more here and you're just, you're, you're living your life for the weekend kind of thing. I never told you to pick those up. I told you to pick up the burden, the weight of loving your family, of bringing the good news to people that need it. I told you to pick up gathering together and growing in community. I told you to pick up the burden of knowing me more and worshiping me. I didn't tell you to pick up all that other stuff. And so let me say this. The reason why I think a part of that quote is true is there comes a point as maturing believers that we have to own that we're no longer just along for the ride, and it's possible that we genuinely are acting out of a lack of faith. Oh, you of little faith. Now, I know none of us would ever say this. Maybe we never would even think these words, but in practice, in, in a practical way, we do oftentimes act as if we deny God's wisdom. And like he doesn't know what's going on. We act as if we deny that God loves us and that he doesn't care about us. We act as if we deny his power and that he's not able to actually deliver us out of the snare, the temptation, the pressure that we're under. And so please hear me. Don't 
let what I'm saying right now be condemnation that crushes you and moves you further away from God. Some of you, probably most of you just need to hear that God loves you. He is for you. And this is something where he wants to give you strength and hope to walk you through this. But there, and maybe it's just a few, but there are some of you in here that need to hear me on this. You are receiving the life and the fruit and the results of the seeds you keep planting. And you are walking under the anxiety that you refuse to give up. And at some point, I don't know when, and I don't even want to get close to the when. I can't define the line because the line should never be there. At some point, us carrying anxiety for long periods of time, it actually does become sin. Because what does a life that's crushed and under the, the wet, dark, dank blanket of anxiety, how does that ever lead anyone to freedom? Why would anyone look at your life and they go, I don't know what they have, but I want more of whoever they follow. At some point, our testimony is hindered and it becomes sin if we refuse to give up the burden and the yoke that God never wanted us to carry. Again, we have to be balanced in this. The church oftentimes has gotten this wrong and we have been more abusive and religious than we should be. Oh, you're struggling? You're just not praying enough. Oh, you're broken over this? Well, it's been two weeks. You should have, you know, mourned for a season, but now there's joy in the morning and you should get past this. The church has not done this well. We have to own this, that at times we have word of faith beat people over the head. And yes, we got to speak the truth. And we gotta point people back to the word. But you don't point people back to the word standing in a pulpit like this. You point people back to the word by walking with them, by weeping when they weep and rejoice when they rejoice and spending the time through life to walk with them. And maybe there's a time where you have to say, listen, it's been long enough. You've wallowed in this muck and this mire long enough, but now it's time to get up. Dry bones, get up life on those dry bones and live the victorious life that God has for you. But I just believe that sometimes as Christians, we, because we don't actually want to get our hands dirty, if I'm being honest, hey, how you doing? How's your day going? We don't really want to get our hands dirty. And so when we hear dirty answers, we're like, ah, I don't, my theology doesn't really want to have room for that. All right, that's for one of you. I don't know who it is. <laughs> that one person. Oh, ye of middle faith. No, um, moving on. Because this is fun. Actually, let me say one more thing. I would probably reword it like this. Worry can be a sin if we let it go on too long. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 32, the next two verses. Therefore, do not be anxious. There it is again. So simple, so black and white. Or technically, if you're reading your Bible, it's most likely red. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying... What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. Gentiles in this context are those that don't believe in God. They are unsaved people. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Or in other words, the pagan consumeristic culture that we're in right now, that we're all a product of, it is screaming at us 24-7, eat this Wear this, watch this, be this, sound like this, be a part of that group. You need more to be bigger, better, faster, stronger, better looking, more, 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 more. And Jesus said, the Gentiles, those that don't have a relationship with God, those that are not saved, those people look after those things. But we're not supposed to be like that. This is the countercultural part. Yeah, but I live in America and I should be able to have some of it. Fine. But there's a difference between you having those things and those things having you. And when you have no, when you have, when you're full of anxiety and you're losing sleep and things are stressed out around you because you don't have the more, it's possible that you ventured in forth into territory of the Gentiles. The Gentiles seek and run after and strive after those things and do whatever they have to do to sell themselves on the altar of those things. And so when we lose our anxiety over those, or when we have anxiety and we lose our peace over those things, we have an issue. We're beginning to look more like those that don't know God than those that do know God. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Every Sunday night... At 5 o'clock, we have youth group here, junior high, senior high. 
And I'm here for most of them. I'll be here tonight. So if you have junior high students, senior high students, come on out. Let's have some fun. And we have a great time. But the way we have it designed, among many great fun things that we do, worship, message, games, all that kind of stuff, at the beginning, we have like a big dinner table. And we sit down and we eat together. And it's great. It's actually my favorite part of the entire night. And uh, last week, it just kind of happened where we didn't have a lot of volunteers. And so it was myself and two other ones, and I was scheduled for the meal. Now, if you know anything about me, you know, I don't know how to cook. Mac and cheese is about all you're getting out of me. So I'm like, I have two options, pizza or what I eventually went with, which is a cereal buffet. All right? Now, hear me out on this. Those of you health nuts out there, you're going to hate every part of this example, but you're probably right. But for me, if I was a student and someone said, I'm going to bring in a bunch of different cereal and you can just have whatever you want, I would be like, yes, this is the greatest day. And so I thought that I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to pick up what these students love. And so I go there and actually here's a picture. Uh, <laughs> this is literally not even half of what I bought. I had two rules. This was taken by a volunteer at the church, by the way, like, Pastor Jerry, I'm going to go show this to your wife. And they did. So two, here I had two rules. Rule number one, it had to be a cereal that I've never heard of before. And number two, it had to be a cereal that most likely my wife would not allow into my house. This was like my night to like party, right? And I know, I know, as an adult, I should be the mature one in the room and we should all sing Kumbaya and eat, you know, cucumbers. But it was my night to cook. Don't throw shade on me. I don't know how to cook. And so I pick up all this cereal and all this milk, and I come, and I'm waiting for youth group to start because I'm thinking when I reveal this magnificent spread that the children will begin singing my name in the streets of praises. <laughs> they will begin de declaring how great and wonderful I am. Not at all the response I received. They're like, what's this? Because they're so used to really good meals. The person that does our cooking does a phenomenal job. It's like a full-blown meal every single time. It tastes good. It's usually very nutritious or kind of close to nutritious. And this is just a pile of sugar. And so I'm expecting them to be rejoicing. And they're like, we don't want this. Where's the food at? Right? I'm like, come on. I mean, I'm getting my, my leaders are giving me looks like, what are you doing? And like, you're an adult. Act like one. I don't want to act like an adult. And... I act like one every single day. I want to just be that guy for a little bit. And so I'm there. I'm like, well, you know what? Skip this. I'm going to go have fun. I don't care what these people say. And so I start going down and getting all these cereals. Bear in mind, this is not Cheerios. This is not that kind of cereal. These are all things that I, again, never knew even was a thing. For example, there is a box of cereal that I bought that was labeled Oreos. That's it. Not like Oreo Delight or Splish Splash Oreos or anything. It's just literally a box of miniature size Oreos that you pour milk on and that's what you eat. America, right? <laughs> there was another one. Another one that was from Wendy's and it was Frosties. It's literally just chocolate cereal that tastes like, that makes the milk taste like Frosties. Delicious. They had s'mores. I had French toast. It was amazing. They had these things right here. Dunkaroos, right? Dunkaroos. I can tell you, first service, I didn't realize this. I just took a big old, big old spoonful of it. But I can tell you right now, Dunkaroos has nothing on Oreos. And so we're sitting there. And I'm not doing big bowls like this. I got like little samples of every one. I just wanted to try. I'm just kind of going down there. And the kids are maybe taking a bowl. They're looking at me like, man, you're losing control. Like, you, you need help. And I'm just like, mm, this is so good. I'm just loving every second of it. Man, these just are not good. Don't buy these. <laughs> it was the only box left. Afterward, the students took boxes home. I was trying to destroy the evidence. They didn't take this one, and I understand why. <laughs> so we eat, and I crushed through the cereal. I mean, really embarrassing. And now we're sitting, it's time for worship, or, or for the service. And they start off with the message, and I'm telling you, my eyes are wide open. Whoa! Like, it is sugar rush high, and I am like, I'm like, yes! Whatever's happening is amazing! And I was enjoying life. 
until about 20 minutes into it. I kind of like look down the aisle and every one of the students are like, they're all like starting to like lose energy. Like, I don't want to be here. And all I can think, now the room was technical over there, but all I could think as the person sharing a message, the word of God, the only thing that was going through my mind is, I want some more cereal. (laughs) There's no way I'm making it through this night without cereal. And I'm just like dreaming of Oreos and everything else is sweet and delicious. And, and so the only way, and I was so tired. Like at that point, I was doing okay before youth group. That annihilated me. I was bouncing off the walls and then I was flat on the ground energy wise. And for the rest of the night, I couldn't rebound. I felt terrible. The next morning, ugh, <laughs> felt terrible the next morning. Did not at all feel good. And... Um, the reason I share all this is that's what happens with cereal, right? Like, and sugary things. It could be cereal or it could be lattes or it could be pop or ice cream or whatever it is. We kind of can get into like a sugar doom loop, right? So in this example, I could eat the cereal. The only thing that would have, after the lull, that would have woke me up would be to go have some more sugar or to go, you know, pound another thing of coffee or whatever. And I mean, technically what would have been right would have been drink some water, eat a carrot and go to bed. But I wasn't going to do that. It was still youth group. And so, and don't worry, parents, if you're like, I don't want to send my student to that youth group. There's much more mature people that lead the youth group than I. So you're fine. All right. I'm like the fun uncle. So anyway, um, I'm, you, the doom loop is now I'm tired. I need more sugar. I need more caffeine. So you take more sugar, more caffeine, you wake up and then you crash even more. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm only halfway through my eight hour shift. I got to power up some more and you crush a monster and you go through it. And the doom loop just keeps getting bigger and bigger, higher highs and lower lows. And you have to keep doing more and more to feed the beast. It is the exact same thing when it comes to our anxiety. We are called by God to to have our hearts focused on him, our sight zeroed in, and to be feeding on the word of God. In fact, it says in Philippians chapter four, verse six through eight, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let me stop right, right there. That's only six, verse 6 and 7. This verse right here, there have been messages and series and books and podcasts written about this. To par- pulling this portion of Scripture apart is so important. The simplicity of it is when you're full of anxiety, when you're taking on the cares of this world more than just kind of ebb and flowing with stressful things that come your way, when that's taking place, you need to stop. You need to pray to God, believe in God with prayer and thanksgiving. Actually worship God, declare how good he is, how faithful he's been to you throughout all of your life. And in doing that, it says the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, is there to guard your heart and your mind. It's, it's surpasses understanding because you can actually have peace and strength and hope and joy while things around you are falling apart. It doesn't make sense, but isn't that one of the marks many times of a Christian in a broken, dark world is that when you're going through the worst parts of your life, even though you still weep, even though you still have to deal and struggle and kind of fight through those things, you have peace and you've not lost peace. It says it will actually guard your heart and your mind. So that scripture in and of itself is so powerful. I could could have spent today's entire message just on that. But it's the next verse that's seldom read with it. But it's so important, and I don't believe for one second is a coincidence that it's a part of the same portion of scripture. Verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure... Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is, any ex- is there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Back to the doom loop. When you've eaten something terrible, sugar-wise, 
You could make a good choice. Most likely you're going to go and eat some more sugar, some more caffeine, some more whatever it is to keep that doom loop going. It's bad for you. You know it. You've probably heard a thousand different people tell you it's not right, and yet we still do it. The same thing happens with us when it comes to our anxiety. We're sitting there, and we're like, man, I've had a rough day. This has just been terrible. And we go home, and we spend time just scrolling, scrolling, or turning on the news, or binge watching this, or looking at that, and, and, or pursuing whatever it is that will distract us and whatever it is that will numb us. What's well, my hobby? It's what I like to do. And those are great. I'm not saying that your cell phone's bad and Netflix is bad and all these things, but when they're out of order, when they're out of priority, and especially when they become medication to you, then you have fallen into the doom loop of anxiety. Because it is impossible to read and watch and do all those things and long-term have them bring life to you. Maybe for the moment you'll laugh. For the moment you'll find enjoyment out of it. But eventually it will draw life out of you, not add it to you. And so you've come home broken after life and after work and you do something that you think is going to medicate it and it doesn't. And you're sitting there and you have to do more to make yourself feel a little bit more numb and you just keep adding in, piling in anxiety building habits after anxiety building habits and you build a lifestyle of not focusing in on God but consuming the junk that you were never designed to consume. We weren't meant to live off Dunkaroos. We're never, this is not what God intended us. He didn't like spin everything into creation and be like, and cinnamon toast crunch, right? This is junk. It doesn't add to our life. It takes away from our life. And the same thing is true with what we consume for entertainment, for fun, for just unwinding. If we are not mindful, our life becomes a Dunkaroo roller coaster. And then we come to church beat up, broken, like, and you hear someone say, Don't be anxious about anything. You're like, yeah, I wish I had his life. I wish I was there. And it's quite possible. It's not the only thing, but it's quite possible that you have allowed yourself to so live in the doom cycle of anxiety and that anxiety medication, consume, 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 that you need to be broken out of that. And I love what it says at the beginning of that portion of Scripture, that if you're in that place of anxiety, then bring it to God in prayer with thanksgiving, And God will be right there. And so there's some of you right now, you're not necessarily in the doom loop of anxiety. You're just broken and you're exhausted. Bring it to God in prayer with thanksgiving. There's some of you that are fully in the doom loop. Bring it to God with prayer and thanksgiving. But let's make sure that verse number eight is also a part of the answer. That what you consume, what you look at, what you think about, what you speak about, what your, what your friend circles are focused on, they are things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. It's not the only thing that gets you out of the anxiety doom loop, but it is a foundational discipline that should be there um, all the way through your life. In fact, I want to say this because, uh, again, this is something that the church historically has not done well at. These are all portions of answers. Some of them might solve it right away, might bring complete everything that you need right away. Some of you, you might need additional help. And this is where the church has failed. We try to be everything to everybody and every answer to everybody at all times. There are some of you, you need to go see a counselor and there's nothing wrong with that. And I want to apologize on behalf of believers that maybe have made you feel like you are not a faith-filled person because you're still struggling with this. There might be some things that you need to still submit to the Lord, but you know what? Oftentimes, when we are broken down, we need to go see professional help. If your car's broken down and you're someone like me who doesn't have the answer, you bring it to a mechanic. And the church has done a bad job of shaming people and saying that mental health is not important. Mental health is very important. And I believe that everything that we have need of is found in the word of God. But I also believe this. Sometimes we need help getting there by people who know more than we know. 
And so maybe you need medication to help level things out. There's, you're not broken because you need that stuff. And you're not a, lack, a person with lack of faith because you need that stuff. Now, I, let me balance it out for a second. Some of you, you've ran to the pills and you've ran to the, the counseling from everybody else. You've ran to those things before you ever went to Jesus. And that's a problem. You, you, you just go, you know what? God's got nothing for me. It's all in the professional world. I'm only going to get it from there because they're trained. They went to school. They got all the information. Listen, it is an all of the above sometimes approach. And this is why the lifestyle of thinking and focusing on whatever is honorable, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, commendable, praiseworthy, and excellent, the discipline of that must be before we ever see a counselor, during seeing a counselor, and after seeing a counselor, because it is a Christian, Christ-following discipline that grows up in the things of, of God's purity and God's holiness. And so, yeah, once we were baby Christians that drank milk, but God's calling some of you right now to grow up and grow into the things. And there's a lot of grace. Don't worry. This is not a beat you up. You better figure this out by tomorrow or you're done. God will walk with you every step of the way. It's my privilege as a church to walk with you through maybe it's pastoral meeting that way or maybe it's in community groups or one-on-one, get some coffee, whatever it is. There is grace when we call upon the name of the Lord. And so again, I hope that you hear me on this. It's not one thing or the other oftentimes. It is God, whatever tool, whichever way and avenue you want to get this to me, I accept it, I celebrate, I thank you for it. But all the way through, God, I choose to refocus my heart in on you, which means for some of you, you need to shut the video games off. Some of you, you need to turn off uh, those things that have been keeping you up late at night and then you wake up early in the morning going, why do I feel terrible? Why do I have so much anxiety? Some of you need to get out of your friend groups that you're in because they're dragging you down and the gossip and the negative talk is doing nothing but destroying you. And whatever it is, as believers, we need to take steps closer to Christ in this. And the beautiful thing is, is God's with us every step of the way. Amen? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And so if the pattern that's set right there is that if you prioritize the kingdom of God first, what he says, his word, the focusing in on the honorable things like I just mentioned, if you'll do that, then all the other things that we worry about in the right way, in the right time, into the right measure, they'll be added to us so they're actually a blessing and not a curse. Well, that's the template, then the opposite is true as well. If you seek those things first and above and more than the kingdom of God, then you will walk in lack. So some of you, this is a reminder. Some of you, this is a dose of reality. That you're possibly, you're walking and you are receiving the fruit of seeds that you have planted over a lifetime. And again, there's no shame on that. It's just, let's walk towards God in that. Let's acknowledge it. Let's give it to Christ. Let's not let that reality drive us from God, but let it drive us to God. We read in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, that it's talking about the seeds that God plants, which is his word in our life, that those seeds are choked out by thorns. And those thorns in that scripture are defined as the worldly pressures and distractions of life, the concerns, as it says. Or in other words, you can read all the right scriptures, you can sing all the right songs, you can go all the church services in the world, but if you continue to let the worldly concerns, the distractions take all of your attention, it will choke out the seed of God's word just like thorns do to an actual seed. And so it's a balance. Sometimes it's an attack from Satan, it's demonic, and we have to denounce that and Plead the blood of Christ over that. Sometimes it's attack from other people. Oftentimes, if I'm being honest in my own life, it's because I have taken my hands off of the responsibility that God has given me to protect my thoughts and my words, and I have allowed whatever thought that comes my way to distract me or to drive me to be rampant in my life. 
There's something that for the last five months has been driving me nuts. It's been keeping me up. I've lost sleep. I'm stressed out over it. And I'm just, Lord, what do I have to do about this? And God just convicted my heart three weeks ago. Why are you so full of anxiety about this? Nothing that you have done in the worrying has helped you. And the reality was, is I was not praising God for what he had done. And I was not asking God in a right motive for more of what I need. Remember, pray and with thanksgiving. I haven't been doing that. And I certainly was allowing myself to be more and more distracted with the comforts of life than I was being someone that was remaining diligent to the goodness of God. And so I'm preaching this message to myself as I have to do over and over and over again. This is not a pray at once and it's done. This is a lifestyle of surrendering to the Lord. Last scripture of today's Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Therefore, do not, let, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day has, is its own troubles. Can I get an amen for that last part? <laughs> I got enough things I got to worry about today, let alone tomorrow. Because when you start compiling tomorrow and next week and next month, and you take the worry of which doesn't help whatsoever, and you compound that upon what you already have today, you are literally taking on burdens that God never designed for you to carry. Why? Because it says in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 through 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Every single morning you wake up in God's brand new mercies and grace. And his faithfulness is made new for you every single day. Walk in the grace gift that God has given you today. And let God, invite God, believe for God to take care of tomorrow. Again, do everything you can. But recognize that you were only called to carry so much. It's Christ who empowers you, who strengthens you. And if you can do this, whatever this is, whatever you're doing, if you can do it without praying to God, without worshiping to God, without seeking his face, without knowing his voice, if you're able to go through days, weeks, months without ever inviting God into that process or barely inviting him in, you are doing it in your own strength. Not by strength, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Let's stand up together. We're going to end by re-singing a song that we did earlier today. A better word. The blood of Jesus that covers us. Oh God, would you open our eyes to see the higher truth, the better word, whatever it is. They know, you know what they're going through. But Lord, would you, as we sing this now, Lord, would you literally just have the heaviness lift off of us? In fact, in this room right now with no one looking around, quietly to yourself, can you just name the thing that's bringing you anxiety? Maybe it's a person's name. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's something else. Just name it right now. Identify what that is right now. Now, that's not something that needs to keep weighing you down. Maybe you're like, man, I got way more. You didn't give me enough time. Just, it's all right. As we sing, regardless of how you feel right now, you may not be feeling it at all. I know. You're like, man, I just want to go home. It's hot in here. Let's go. But why don't we, why don't, as we sing, why don't we let this be a prophetic word, a word that literally goes into our future and with God prepares the way for us. It's a better word. It's a higher truth. healing every wound your blood is making all things new your blood speaks a better word your blood the measure your blood the measure of my the
better word speaks a better word cause your blood is your blood a robe of righteousness your blood yes my hope and my defense your blood yes forever covers me forever covers me thank you lord it's singing out with light oh it's shouting down the lines it echoes through the night the precious blood of christ a better word speaks a better word let's just sing that let's sing that over the things just like pastor jerry said if you remember that thing call it to your mind to your memory right now and right now god we just in this moment help us to just to see you, not our neighbor. Not the way we feel, God, but right now, help us just to see you. It's just you and I. How would I sing that song over this specific circumstance, over my life? God, could I identify the heaviness? And right now, as we sing that your blood has a better word, is singing out with life, we sing it as if it's just you and us right now. Just you and me. Let's sing. It's singing out with life. It's singing out with life. It's shouting down the lies, yeah. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. It's calling out my name. It's calling out my name. Oh, it's breaking every chain. Yeah, it's making all things right. So, Lord, I just ask that as we leave this place today, Lord, that you would minister to our spirits. Lord, help us to discern what's needed. Certainly always the, the focusing in on you, but, Lord, if there's more that's needed, to call that strong Christian friend, to connect with the church, to ask for professional help, Lord, whatever it is, God, would you lead and guide us in that? Lord, we want to be examples of your freedom. We want to be examples of those who are able to cast their cares upon you, Lord, and have the confidence in you that you are working on our behalf. And so, Lord, my prayer is that none of this today is the wrong kind of burden, the one that causes shame. And, yep, there it is again. I've just messed another thing up. Not that, Lord. But, Lord, we would see that in and through all of it, the reminder that you said, that are we not worth more than all of the creation that you've made? It's not our days numbered and counted, the hairs on our heads known. Were we not knit together in our mother's womb and known before we were ever conceived? And did you not have plans and purposes for us to give us a hope in a future. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would give, ultimately, that you would give all of us a better understanding of our identity in you so that we would not be satisfied with anything less than that which lines up with that identity. I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.